Thanks for joining us. This week, another Super City special. Two insiders give us their views on just how the country's first Super City Council is performing. And right now, it all looks like business as usual. The Auditor General's worried about funding for the Council's first big long-term plan. The Manarewa Local Board's angry about the Council's mothership mentality. The Mayor's having a crack at Snapper for dragging the chain over integrating their so-called smart ticket with the city's single public transport ticketing system. And the Transport Committee Chairman, he's bagging Auckland Transport for giving the wrong impression about the high cost of the inner city rail loop. And just as industrial relations at the ports calm down, it looks like our next stop could be another confrontation in the city's bus services. Teething troubles or systemic problems? That's the theme we're taking up with two experienced insiders on the Super City Council. The former Deputy Mayor of Waitakere City and a former Mayor of Auckland City. First up, Selwyn Manning talks to Waitakere Ward member and Deputy Mayor of Auckland, Penny Hulse. And welcome to the programme, Penny Hulse. Thank you, Selwyn. It's lovely to be here. Yeah. It's um, been over 20 months since Auckland has voted for councillors and their mayor in this uh, Auckland super city structure. Um, how, how is that uh, performing after all this time? It's been a pretty tough first half. Um, obviously, you know, we had to get up and running from day one. The Auckland Transition Authority put the, the council together and we, we kind of moved into a bit of a done deal. We've had to do a long-term plan. We've had to get the Auckland plan up and running. And now we're doing the unitary plan and all this in about 18 months. So it's been a huge challenge. So it's a lot of plans. Um, can, can you, in simple languages, can you tell us what the difference is between the long-term plan and your unitary plan? Indeed. So perhaps if we start with the Auckland plan, which is the sort of the one plan to rule them all, and that sets out for the next 30 years basically how Auckland's going to look, the things that we need to do with regard to infrastructure, the planning for social infrastructure, in other words, you know, libraries, schools, the things that our community need, and also looking at where growth will, will happen. Now that the Auckland plan is done, the unitary plan actually brings together the seven district plans, the rules and regulations that say how that happens. In other words, when you build a house, what can you build where and what do you need to go through to make it happen? Exactly. Obviously we need one plan so that it's standard across Auckland. I understand tomorrow you will be um, tabling formally, is it, um, the unitary plan or seeking a response from Aucklanders on it. What kind of mechanisms are you putting in place so Aucklanders can kind of interact with you on what they want? So all we're doing tomorrow is actually talking about the process by which we're going to make the unitary plan happen. It does sound as if we're doing a lot of planning and a lot of process, but we have to do this so that, you know, Auckland is actually run in a sensible way for the next 30 years. So tomorrow's discussion um, at the Auckland Plan Committee is about setting out the timeline um, for the unitary plan, how we're going to talk to Aucklanders about it, how people can get involved. Obviously, the Auckland Plan set out the big vision, the unitary plan now impacts on everybody, so we want to take the right amount of time so people can be engaged. Okay, um, so we're looking at what the visions and the plans are. Um, obviously to meet those visions, you know, you've got to have a functioning super city. Um, I know in the, in the lead up to amalgamation when the legislation was being drafted, you were very critical, it's no secret is it, that you're Not very critical of that. Um, I was marching in the streets in marching Henderson. In the streets. <laughs> and what were the main significant points that you were concerned about and have they you know, bought, come, to, come to pass in the last 20 months? In summary, um, and by way of background, at that stage I was the Deputy Mayor of Waitakere City. So the West was worried, um, like some other communities, that we would lose our identity, that the West would simply become part of a homogenous sort of Auckland. Secondly, that the projects that were absolutely critical to the West would be lost in the competition for, for budget. And thirdly, that the way that we worked with our communities out West, that that would be lost in the super city structure. Okay, so let's look at, say, the identity of Waitakere City. It's the same as Manukau with its identity, yeah. Papakura District, Franklin, um, up in the northwest areas, obviously, as well. Um, ha ha have the identities been lost somewhat under this great big expensive so-called super city? It's a really interesting question, Selwyn. We, we feel 
to some degree that perhaps we have been a little bit lost in the process, but that's only because the super city itself is actually still a little bit hard to understand, where people could just ring me and say, look, I've got a footpath problem, help me fix it. They now have to go through quite a lot of processes to do that. But interestingly enough, and this is something I didn't see happening, the identity of some of these communities has actually strengthened, and I'll speak for the West because that's the area I know best. People have taken up the challenge themselves. Our community organisations are organising themselves together, they're joining hands, they're making sure that the identity of the West and the way that the West functions is not going to be lost. And I think that's a fantastic thing. Mm. And it would be fair to say, do you think, that if you were living outside of Auckland or even indeed mm. overseas, that if you thought of Auckland City and the super city, you would think of the CBD. And that seems like the mainstream media's yeah. attention has been primarily on the CBD. Is it, How do you address that? How do you actually change that to show that there is this absolute kind of dynamic of different cultures right across yeah. the expense? There's a couple of ways. The, our local boards, and we've got 21 local boards that represent the different communities in Auckland, our boards are gaining bigger profile and I think that's the local boards are, are pretty important to the retention of identity for these areas. However, we do battle the media, and I, it would be great if the Herald actually reported outside of the CBD. It's very hard to get them to, you know, to be interested if something is, you know, more than three kilometres of Queen Street. But I make no excuses for the fact that the council is focusing on the centre of the city. We've got the city centre master plan, which is a fantastic plan for the centre of the city. We do need to be the gateway to New Zealand mm. and we need to have a fabulous, vibrant city centre to do it. Mm. If you're looking at some of the criticisms that were widespread as the legislation was being drafted, one of the, those that stood out, I think, was that um, there, it appeared that there would be very little ability for the mayor and indeed the councillors to actually have hands-on oversight of the CCOs, these council control organisations. Yeah? Mm. Um, has that been borne out, that concern? It's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag, so on. We, um, we have a, an increasingly good relationship with our CCOs. They are peopled with some extraordinarily gifted directors on, on the CCOs, some of which we've chosen, some of which were chosen for us. So the CCOs themselves are a pretty, you know, mm. go get them bunch. I'm just so thinking, we are, yeah. it's, it's an interesting balance between us wanting to have complete control mm. and thereby squash some of the good opportunities they provide. But I think we do need to have a, a bit more clarity. Auckland Transport, for instance, yep. we've been a little bit um, removed from the priority setting. Yeah, I was going to focus yeah. on Auckland Transport. Obviously, it came to public attention, you know, during the Rugby World Cup last oh, yeah. year and um, the fiasco of people not being able to get to the game, et cetera, et cetera. And it seemed like the, uh, the mayor, mainly, um, was carrying <laughs> the can after that as everybody deserted oh. the ship. And yet there's this distance. Yeah. Um, now, who Actually, ultimate... It's not that distant. The CCOs do what they do and we get the blame. So we... You know, we just, <laughs> That's a close conjure. We, we yeah. do understand that. But, but um, who, who was ultimately responsible for that from the council, council and the mayor's, um, your deputy mayor position? I think there was an interesting cascade. God, I don't really want to revisit mm. that, that whole thing. But we, we were told by the government um, that... Party Central was to happen down on the wharf, mm. absolutely categorically, and that's what it needed to be. We warned of the, the problems around transport and, and planning, but, um, you know, it's old history. Yeah, a lot of water history. under the bridge. I guess what there. I'm leading to, Penny, is um, from the point of view of a public oversight, that the public really the is left... The stops with us. Yeah, the really, buck, buck it is stops the mayor, with deputy guys, mayor and councillors. At the end of the day, the public deserves the right to be able to see whether or not those inside transport mm. were actually doing the job. I mean, for example, contracting out a certain amount of... Um, buses and trains for a very small number of people seem to be way under the under the figures and, and and so the public's left well who really is to blame here the mayor when he re he just kind of let silence speak for himself on on when he was asked for that or or is it um, like Mark Ford at the time who was heading the uh, transport aspect line? Probably would have been good to have had Mark a wee bit more visible but the lesson that we learned from there is when we when we really have large events, when we've got, you know, the Central City Rail Loop, we need the top political oversight and we absolutely need to have joint governance on the big issues. And if ever the CCO doubts that that's important, we will remind them of okay. the opening night of Rugby World Cup.
Now, of course, to keep a city running, you've got to have revenue, and revenue uh, and, and rates are hand-in-hand uh, hand in this sense. Um, in recent weeks, there's been quite a lot of attention on rates increases. Um, the mayor saying that just over 3% average is actually fair in a rates increase. Um, then we see your opponents, for example, those who would criticise you, like Cameron Brewer, fellow councillor, um, saying that uh, really the rates are, are screaming out for attention here, that they're climbing up too high. What's your position on that? I've got no position on what Cameron states, but on the other hand, I think we just need to let a little bit of truth um, be brought into this debate. Rates are always a headline. People are irritated by rates, and I think the reality is that at approximately $6 a day to have your toilet flushed, water through your taps, roads to drive on, public transport subsidised, rubbish collected, libraries to go to, art galleries, events, mm. the list goes on and on and on. And it it's costs. actually very good va good value. And I think we're not doing a very good job of explaining to people what rates well, buy. Well, let's just look at this. Like um, Cameron Brewer claims here in media reports that nearly 24,000 businesses face an increase. Um, the average increase is 12.8%. What well, Cameron's forgetting, and I think so, and I'd like to just take a moment on this, the rates that council is responsible for, we've put them up by 3.6%. So in other words, the amount of money that council brings in per year has gone up 3.6%. So some people get a massive increase we and others get a loss. We were required by government to move to capital value rating for the entire Auckland region, and that's what we've done. The move to capital value rating is responsible for the big swings and roundabouts. Cameron very conveniently forgets this, and my opponents on council, mm. our opponents on council yeah. forget this. One, one of the things too, you, you know, you hear from the rural sector, those on lifestyle blocks mm. and rural blocks, for example, saying, boy, ours are going up by big dollars here. Is, is that well, hang fair? Hang on a minute, hang on a minute, no. There are some farms, they've changed the farming differential, we've changed the farming differential. Mm. Some farms will get a rates increase. However, out west, for people on large blocks of land, the west was rated land value. So people on a large piece of land with a tiny wee house were paying three or four times as much as someone on a tiny piece of land with a very large house, so they get which a is reduction? inequitable. Their rates come down. Okay. Um, if you were looking at um, reform, to really get Auckland moving, to really meet those visions and those goals, the long-term plan, what legislation is required, what reform is required by central government to actually enable that to occur? I think the best thing government can do is actually to just slow down some of the reform. I think the the minister and this current government are racing ahead with local government reform. Is this the new reform. minister or the old this is minister? The, well, the one we've got at the moment. We do we speak of the minister that we seem to have at the moment. Who knows what might happen tomorrow? But the reality is that local government actually has a very good sense of what it needs to do for the next decade, whether they be councils of Auckland size or some of the tiny rural councils, we're required to plan 10 years ahead. Now this is quite different from central government. I doubt whether you could quote the figures, taxes, funding and budgets for the next 10 years. We can mm. at, at local government level. I'm just thinking on the reform though, from the point of view of those those problems that you had identified prior to amalgamation, um, some of those concerns that seem to linger on in some of the sectors of Auckland about n uh, not enough public oversight of the CCOs, are those things that structurally can be changed by new reformed legislation and really get some sort of um, unanswered question type of approach for those who want to observe the function of council? I think we can unpack it a little bit. I think in in the Auckland, um, in, in, in our side of things, the CCO reform I think will be a, an ongoing process and I, I don't know whether legislation will be required to make change. If it is required, we'll go to the government and ask for that to happen. At the moment I think we can work with our CCOs to work on the, those oversight issues. The one area where I think some legislative change should be discussed is in our ability to to fund our transport requirements and Auckland has been stymied every step of the way when we've gone to government to say for the central city rail loop we wish to investigate alternative methods of transport the government so far has been singularly unhelpful and I think that's where legislative reform may well be required for councils to be more creative in the way <coughs> excuse me that we 
that we deal with large issues like infrastructure. Penny Hulse, thank you very much. Thank you, Selwyn. Selwyn Manning talking there to Penny Hulse, Waitakere Ward Member and Deputy Mayor. We'll get another insider's perspective in just a moment on The Beatson Interview.